since I started doing web development three, maybe four years ago, I have always been writing TypeScript. I've never done anything with raw JavaScript. I remember very well when I was first starting out, this was kind of the tutorial that got me into web development. Uh, shout out to Net Ninja. He makes awesome videos. I learned off of his tutorials. Um, it's kind of nostalgic looking back on this, but this tutorial was basically a React, Redux, and Firebase app with React in raw JavaScript, no TypeScript. Not really a stack I would ever recommend anyone use these days. It was a little unhinged. I think we were even using class components in here. Uh, it might have been a different one, but I, it was pretty bad. But still, for the time, it was great, and it did get me into web development. But I remember back then, I was watching a bunch of like Ben Awad videos and Fireship videos and stuff like that. And when we got into the actual code over here and he started writing the pieces, instead of writing them in JS, I wrote them raw in TypeScript. I've been doing TypeScript from the beginning. So lately, as I've started to see more and more kind of anti-TypeScript, anti-static typing people popping up, it's become very trendy and popular on Twitter to call TypeScript trash and say that JavaScript raw is better. You know, I wanted to go investigate it. I very much felt like I would hate this. It would be a very miserable experience. And it pretty much was until it wasn't. The app I built out with this stack of just raw JavaScript and SvelteKit, I still use my boy SvelteKit. I'm not getting rid of that. Um, but the app I built here was just a super simple, I mean, this is like the most basic crud you can ever get to. There is nothing complicated about this at all. Um, but it is, it did allow me to at least kind of see how it feels. And what I built out here is just basically an ideas tracker thing. Kind of the whole idea here is I made videos about this in the past, but I was taking pocket base and SvelteKit and raw JS, putting them together and creating these kind of nice personal internal tools. So one of these is just like, I go for walks and go to the gym all the damn time. So if I'm out there and I'm like, Hey, I have a random idea, like, um, make this video not suck. And then I can call this a video idea. I can fix my grammar and then I can go in here and save it. It'll save my idea. And then over here in my little pocket based backend, I can see that I wanted to make this video not suck. You can host this on a $5 VPS by building the SvelteKid site to be a just static HTML page, serve that through the pocket based static directory. And it's, it's quite cool. The whole thing felt really cool and fun to build with. And yeah, but really one of the biggest things I did with this was do raw JavaScript. There was no static typing in here, no TypeScript nonsense. Uh, the code base was entirely just in JS. Now, obviously these are dot svelte files, but in SvelteKit, what you can do is you can set your script tag up here to be lang equals ts, and then you'll get TypeScript support in your file. You can also go in here to your JS config or your TS config and switch this check JS variable. So in here, I set this check JS to be false. So that basically gives me the simulated raw JavaScript experience. If I go ahead and do like some array dot some method dot that doesn't exist, it'll let me do it until it crashes at runtime, which kind of sucks. And when I was first working with this, it was pretty painful. I actually tried this in a different project before this. I completely scrapped it because it was pretty bad, so I don't have it here. But I was building out a more normal SvelteKit app in the way I would normally build them. So it was Superbase plus SvelteKit together and getting all of the setup done for like the... Um, for like the hooks, for the root layout, for all these things was so annoying without TypeScript because in SvelteKit, one of the big things we have here is if we go up here and we do a plus page.server.ts, I do export const load equals async whatever. We go in here and we say it's this. Let me just do return whatever. In this function, we have an event object. And this event object is extremely important. It has tons of different things on it. And in this project that I was working on, I set it so that I didn't have any type checking because here we are using uh, JavaScript with JS docs. So I'm cheating a little bit, um, but we, I had literally nothing. So I do event dot and I'd get no IntelliSense and no type safety on this. So I just had to guess at what all of these are. I would know that I was looking for my cookies or I was looking for some information about the root or I was looking for the URL. I know what I'm looking for, but I just kind of forget where to get it. And that's kind of one of the biggest problems I've run into with the dynamic typing is you don't get that kind of cheat sheet built into your code editor. My junior year of college, I took a web dev class at university and we had to write our application in Rails. That was really, that was the first and only time I was exposed to it. And like, there were parts of it that were really cool, but it was almost like too magical to me. There was no type safety in anything. And I remember just feeling completely lost where like I would just kind of write something into the void and then kind of hope it worked and no type safety, no hints, no kind of guessing at what it is. Cause in JavaScript world, it's pretty easy for me to just kind of take a look at some object, see what's on it and do some inference on how it works from there. So that part of the dynamic typing was not pleasant. 
But the part that was kind of pleasant was when I got into actually working with this project, there is admittedly something nice about having TypeScript just kind of shut its yap and get out of your way. And the best example of this is in my little auth context thing here. So this is a very Svelte 5 -y thing. I know classes are a huge, huge no-no in the tech community right now. Everyone hates them. This is not using like public abstract factory auth store class or whatever that's being double inherited and it's an abstract class and has all this um, polymorphism nonsense and all the buzzwords from software too that I took three years ago that I kind of remember. And we're not doing any of that. We're basically just using it as an object with some methods on it that we can put lifecycle hooks in like effects that like state variables and just mount into our application. If you're a React dev, it's very similar to kind of like a global context. But in my opinion, it's kind of better because it's really easy to just go down here and have our set auth context and our get auth context. Within our root layout, we set our auth context and then anywhere in our app, in any component, in any page, and in any layout that is a child of the layout where we put this set auth context, we can just access this auth store and make it work there. So it's a really nice way of kind of organizing this logic out and not having to deal with TypeScript here was quite nice. If I was dealing with TypeScript, obviously it's very doable. I'd have to go in here to this user. I would have to add in a generic. I would have to say it's either null or it's some other thing. I have to get the type of this uh, pocket base collection. I have to go through and do all that stuff. It would just get really annoying. And it felt really good to not have to deal with that, especially when I was working with a very simple database like this. The pocket base database is literally just kind of a document store. It's very similar to MongoDB or Firestore. If you're familiar with either of those, it's not SQL. And I can definitely see why people like this. There was a nice flow. I just say like, hey, if there's a user, render the children, which is the safe page. Otherwise, just give them the login screen. It's nothing super complicated, but the whole thing just kind of works. And I just don't have to worry about a lot of the TypeScript nonsense I'd have to do to get this to shut up. And this is something we've run into with Insider Viz, working with big, complicated data models and a lot of things. You sometimes find yourself spending more time just writing the damn type instead of just writing the code. You could have written the code in like two minutes. You end up spending a half hour on it because you have to write this big, complicated type to get it to work. So we've kind of just taken to putting any's on things or setting uh, as unknown and then as whatever it needs to be. Or sometimes we just kind of go into a file and just put TS ignore on it and just let it shut up. Because at the end of the day, if it works, it works. I could very much sympathize with the people who hate dealing with TypeScript's nonsense because it does have a lot of nonsense to it. And the other thing about this that I think was pretty cool that I think a lot of people like is the fact that you don't have to deal with the bloat and weight of TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript in small projects obviously works super well, but at work, I have run into multiple times when a project gets to a certain size. Uh, there's one I'm thinking of where it was basically, it's basically like a LinkedIn style social media app we were working on. And we had, it was a full create T3 stack app. So it was just a giant Next.js app with TRPC wrapping our back end. And then we had obviously Next.js on the front end. And this got to be enormous because it was a very big, complicated app. We had like 25, 30 pages. And these were not like silly about pages or blog post pages. These were complicated dashboard pages, each one multiple thousands of lines long. Uh, and then we had probably hundreds of backend API routes. And that project sucked to work with because TypeScript would just slow to a crawl. So like, for example, in Insider Viz, if I go in here and I do like console.log curlist entry dot, I'll get within reasonable speed. I will get all the IntelliSense on this object. But in that project, it was literally taking like 10, 20 seconds to get that to pull up. And it was an agonizing experience to work in. And admittedly, there is just more weight and more abstractions in your code base when you're working with TypeScript. This is something that I've been seeing a ton lately. I haven't fully crystallized my thoughts on this, and I don't even know I'm fully the best person to talk about this. Because again, I'm on the younger side. I'm just kind of learning and doing stuff, building my things as I go. Uh, not a 30 year industry veteran or anything like that, but a big thing I've been seeing a lot of is people kind of rebelling against a lot of the abstractions or whatever. Uh, the most obvious example of this is Next.js, people reverting back to the Golang plus HTMX world of like 
hey, let's just cut out all the complexity. And I think by complexity, a lot of what they're talking about is just the abstractions because this is a hill I will die on. I think that making complicated user experiences that feel really nice is much simpler and easier to do with a JavaScript framework than it is to do with something like HTMX. Obviously it's doable and I need to spend more time with it. Again, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff by any stretch of the imagination, but I can just give you an example here for like Insider Viz. On our email list page, we need to allow the user to input their email, join the email list, and then give them a little toast that says like, hey, you join the email list. And the whole experience of doing this is really, really nice with SvelteKit because I have full stack JS. I can go in here, I can define my form, I can say that it's a post request, I can add in my progressive enhancement, populate my form data with my state variables, but I need to use state variables to make a more dynamic UI. And feel free to fact check me on this if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that like with HTMX, HTMX itself can't make it so that when I click on one of these, it changes the style the way it does here. So you would have to use something like Alpine or jQuery or even React or something like that to get a nice behavior like this versus one just doing it all in SvelteKit. I already have my state right there and I can just do it. And then a big thing I can do down here is I can actually give the user better feedback. I can go ahead and I can say toast.open and give them a nice little toast that says like, hey, we're joining the email list. And then when it's done, I can give them another uh, pop-up to say, hey, welcome to the newsletter. I can clear out the email. I can do all of these things super easily with just like one or two lines of code, just setting all this stuff up. Versus with HTMX, you have to do a bunch of element swapping and moving things around, and it just gets kind of awkward and tricky. And while, of course, you can do it, I would argue that you do kind of end up getting more simplicity and implementation by doing it with a big framework like this. The problem is you lose out the simplicity of not having the abstractions. I have to deal with the fact that there's a Svelte compiler here, that we're using .svelte files instead of just raw.js or raw.go files. Uh, you have to deal with the fact that there's now linters and parsers and a compiler and all these different things versus with an HTMX type thing, you're just returning HTML from an HTTP endpoint that you can write in any language. So I totally get the sort of argument and vibe for why people like that. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's like anything, there's just trade-offs. And I think for me personally, I've kind of settled on, I prefer these trade-offs and I like building this way but I totally get why people like doing it the other way around. But for the sort of JS versus TS debate, I'm a little less understanding because I think the biggest thing that the raw JS people miss is the fact that what they'll always tell you is that you can build things substantially faster by just using raw JavaScript or something like that. And while, like I said earlier, that is kind of true for some things where you don't have to put in generics, you don't have to deal with a bunch of type checking on nulls and undefines and deal with all these things, I think that you are ultimately going to lose out in dev experience. I think you are ultimately going to lose out in speed because of refactoring. Every single project I've worked on that has gone anywhere at all, I've had to do major refactors on. And TypeScript has made this so freaking easy because basically what it turns into is you just go into your endpoint. So let's go in here. Um, this isn't a great example. Let's go to the unsubscribe page. When you go to this page, you pass in some secret ID to get your unsubscribe thing. You would pass this in from an email. So we have to fetch their profile, get their email list entry, and then send down the data so that we can manage that on the page. So imagine in this case, I needed to change something about my database. Let's go into my database definition here and let's go to my email list table right here. And let's just say that I needed to change my... Uh, this from preference marketing emails to preference marketing emails updated. Very contrived example, wouldn't be how you actually do it. But once I've changed this piece right here on my schema, if I go back over to my load function here, it will suddenly start giving me red lines. It'll notice that, hey, in this update call, you're setting it to the wrong value. If I was just doing raw JS, I never would have known that. When I was coming up with this example, I wasn't even thinking about this. I was planning on showing the page dots felt and the problems that happened here, but by the power of TypeScript, I'm able to see what's going on here. And effectively what that means, at least for me, is that whenever I want to refactor something, it's just a game of changing it at the kind of lowest source of truth, whatever you want to call it, and then playing find the red lines until it stops yelling at you. That's it, that's all you have to do. And it's a really nice experience. I don't think, for me personally, I don't think I would ever give that up in any serious project. Again, for these silly little personal tools that I'm building, it's great for fun little indie projects or whatever, it's great. But for the more ambitious, larger projects, I wouldn't get rid of it. Definitely has problems, but overall, I, I think it makes life much, much better. So I know that was a long video. If you made it this far, thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you enjoyed, make sure you like and subscribe. I'll have more content coming in the future on stuff like this. And uh, yeah, hope to talk to you soon.